This is Michael Scott Hollish with the Reform Report, and today we are sitting down with former professional heavyweight boxer Bob Quarry. Bob is the youngest of the famous Quarry boxing brothers, which also include both Jerry and Mike Quarry. Jerry was a heavyweight legend during the golden era of the heavyweight division. He was the only fighter to take on both Muhammad Ali twice and Joe Frazier twice. He had impressive victories against such legends as Floyd Patterson, Buster Mathis, Ernie Shavers, Ron Lyle, and Mac Foster. He fought for the world heavyweight title, and he is currently inducted into the World Boxing Hall of Fame. Mike Quarry fought in the light heavyweight division throughout the 1970s. He fought for the world light heavyweight title against Bob Foster. He had victories against such fighters as Jimmy the Cat Dupree, Joe King Roman, and Mike Rossman. He also had fights against Yaqui Lopez and Bunny Johnson. Bob Quarry did not have the marquee career his two older brothers had. However, he had a very respected amateur and professional career where he went on to fight 24 professional heavyweight matches through the 1980s up into the early 1990s. He had fights against several respected journeyman fighters, as well as such contenders as Jimmy Ellis and future WBO and IBC heavyweight champion Tommy the Duke Morrison. This interview will be discussing Bob's career as well as first-hand insight into his two brothers. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but Mike fought five title matches between state and world-sanctioned bodies. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, maybe more than that because uh, he was sort of state champion for like four years uh -huh. and had six or five or six defenses of that title. So that went along. He was also Texas state champion, California state champion and North American Boxing Federation champion. Wow, that's, yeah, that's impressive. Now, Jerry, did, I mean, as far as the uh, world sanctioned bodies or national sanctioned bodies, did he fight four uh, title fights, Jerry? Uh, the, the, okay, the one with Frazier was actually not, was a world, at that time, Frazier had been given a portion of the heavyweight championship by six states. And then it moved off on their own and trying to form this own thing. That was how Frazier first got his championship. He did fight for that. He fought for the WBA when in the finals of that WBA tournament when Ali's title was taken away. Right. And so he, he actually has um, just two, two chances at the world title, Jerry did. The one thing that I definitely want to point out is that Jerry had very impressive wins. I mean, obviously, he beat Patterson in one fight. He drew with Patterson in another fight. Uh, he beat Buster Mathis. Uh, he beat Ron Lyle, Ernie Shavers, uh, Mac Foster. Uh, I mean... It, he had a, a very impressive resume, but it wasn't just his resume of who he fought. He beat several of these top contending right. fighters. Lee Patterson is the former heavyweight, you know, champion of the world. Um, so that that's a very impressive record. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people try and say Jerry didn't win the big fights. That, that's not true. He was number one contender in the world three times. Absolutely. That means you have to have fought and beat the second greatest fighter in the world at that time to get, he would, to get that. Right. Uh, you know. When I was researching some stuff for, for our interview, is I found a statement by Joe Frazier, and he said 
that he had now this is me quoting him that he that he had no doubt that Jerry could have been the heavyweight champion of the world but he felt that Jerry's handicap was that he cut too easy do you find any truth in that statement from Frazier you know the life in itself is God allows one thing to happen here that right. in the air. Right. And you, you wonder what, what's the reasoning behind that. But Jerry, just sometimes you get cut, sometimes you don't. You know, sometimes that happens, sometimes there's an injury or anything. It just, it's all about how, how things go. I really believe in the first Ali fight. Jerry would have uh, done a, really well had that prolonged. Jerry was in top shape. Ali was coming back for his first fight in three and a half years. Fairly close fight. Ali was moving, especially at that time. But Jerry had been active at the time. Ali hadn't been. So Jerry's endurance, I believe, would have been a little better than his at the time. And I think Jerry would have prospered a little better had that fight gone on. But by chance, he happens to get cut in the third round. Right. The second fight, he's not in that condition that he was for the first fight, and he doesn't get cut, you know, so it's all... It's like the it's luck of the draw, out. right, exactly. right. Exactly. I yeah. step off this curb in front of my house every day, same time. Right. And I'm safe to the other side, but one day, I just might get hit by a car. Right, you can't worry about it. You you go yeah, in and you do what you do. Yeah. Right, your father. I don't know how many people know this, but your father was a boxer, right? Yes. And that's yeah, and but that, what I'm to understand. At 14, he won the Texas uh, State Gold Gloves as a middleweight. Oh, okay. So he was a middleweight yeah. fighter. Right, right, right. And that's obvious. He was, my dad was about five ten. You know, heavier in his older years, but. But middleweight during his, his prime, I believe. Obviously, that's how y'all all got into boxing. Right. Uh, there were some stories. I hear stories. You know, my brothers were actually a generation before me, a right. different generation from me with the age different. And my mom and dad uh, were married. Uh, my mom had the, her first child, Jimmy, in 44, and her last child in 52. So... Eight, eight kids in, in a, a overlapping eight year span. That's a lot of kids. And then had me 10 years later. So I didn't grow up with them as far as kids. We were always a close knit family. And in my my younger years, all, they were always around and stuff. You know, but I didn't grow up with them. At the point that Jerry was already fighting as a contender in the heavyweight division, what was your age at that point? I, I well, Jerry won the National Gold Glove in '65. I was born in '62. Okay. At the end of '62, so I'm two and a half years old when Jerry wins the Gold Gloves in the year '65, and then later that year turned pro. So did you, uh, as a as a kid, did y'all all go? Did the family go to his big fights and all? Oh yeah, we we were always. All my sisters were always getting us in fights out in the auditorium, you know, with all the crowd. So you don't talk about my brother like that. So they were all <laughs> fighting everybody, getting everybody in fights. At the Olympic, I remember that. You know, I was rather young, but uh, I, I definitely remember my sisters not taking any grief from anybody. Right. So with with Mike, obviously, you're closer in age to him. And I know in our previous discussions, uh, you said that you did some training with him when he was uh, fighting pro. Yeah, right now there. I did with Bo okay, Jerry, um, with Mike, that was when I was 17. I started boxing. We all started boxing at four and, four and five years old. That was them and me also. But me with the lap of time in between. Mike was a young pro, late amateur, and Jerry had already turned pro mm -hmm. when I started going to the gym at that age. I remember going to Stan Athletic Club and seeing, you know, some, some legendary fighters. I remember Danny Lopez, Ernie Lopez, Armando Muniz, uh, Mondo Ramos, all them guys when I was a kid. They're, they're legend. 
And, and you know, as a kid, you don't realize what you're really seeing and who you're with and what you're around. And, and you need you need to be in life, man. Just step back and realize what you're getting, what God's given you, and what you're getting to see. You know, and, and totally enjoy it. Right. Well, that's that's good advice to anybody. When you hear your parents say, you know, enjoy your time now. These are going to be the best years of your life. And you're just living life and you kind of don't pay any attention to it. But then when you look Correct. back, you're like, wow, there was truth to that, you know. Correct. And what if I was to save some of them baseball cards I bought them with the bubble gums in them back in the early 60s when I was a kid, I'd be a millionaire by now. Right. And, and y'all, y'all, used, y'all used to put them in the spokes of your bicycle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Now, and then you go back and find, oh, man, that was a Willie Mays I put in that spoke. Right, a Mickey Mantle yeah. card or yeah, something. Yeah, right, yeah. right. One, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you uh, pertaining to, you know, obviously uh, both Jerry and Mike's longevity as, as being, you know, top contender <laughs> fighters, did they always – pretty much generally utilize the same trainers that they always that you know that they started with or did they kind of go through different trainers at different periods okay growing up it was my dad trained them and worked with them mm-hmm. then as they started to progress to the point where they knew they were going to be professionals and so my dad got a little help and uh, from johnny flores and he started co-managing them with, and, co, and co-training room uh-huh. with Johnny Floyd. Um, they boxed till, in California, till about the early 70s, but we got fed, you know, the commission here, I, I, I don't want to put anybody down, but the California State Commission is just not a correct form of a group of people to me, you know. Um, they gave us grief and gave us trouble so so mike and jerry decided they wanted to call uh make jerry fight with eileen eden and stay with certain promoters that were more profitable for the commissions during that time uh, okay so what was in their best interest not not so much the right, fighters best right, interest, right exactly right so jerry then after the, during the early 70s mike went back to florida and jerry went to new york Okay, so then that's how, and that's how Mike ended up here to fight for the Florida State title. Right. In fact, he he went, he popped, got managed by a a gentleman named Pete Ashaw, who owned the Orlando Sports Stadium. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. I remember him coming out in the late 60s when he early 70s when he'd take a Michael over and we he come out to California and he was good friends with Festus remember in Gunsmoke oh okay right and we went over to old Festus's house and visited him I like that oh, he's a good old boy yeah very cool now um yeah, yeah. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, with me being in Tampa, and I know Tampa history and all, but uh, uh, Ferdy Pacheco is a native Tampan. You know, he, right, he's from right. here too, and uh, right. he he was always a really nice guy. I, the few times I ran into him, you know, and uh, and he was a knowledgeable boxing boxing man. He knew he knows his business, you know, and has been around in many many years. Right. Well, he's a, I mean, I guess he started as a fight doctor originally. And yeah, was well, he originally involved with Ali in his early years? Right, right. He was his, he was his uh, uh, corner doctor. Corner, corner and cut, man. Right, um, yeah. right, which I'm imagining uh, that's probably where he and Dundee grew their lifelong relationship because he worked with Dundee, and, you know. And, uh, right. Right, right, right. So, so one thing that I definitely wanted to talk about um, is also your career. Um, obviously, you you fought professionally in the heavyweight division during my era. You know, you fought fighters that I'm well aware of. You fought 24 professional fights, which is very impressive. I really kind of went through your record and, and just kind of studied some of the fighters and. I guess the one fight that a lot of people are familiar with is your 
one of your last fights against Tommy the Duke Morrison, the future WBO and IBC heavyweight champion. But however, uh, uh, your last series of about five fights, you actually fought some very formidable opponents. I mean, David Dixon was a solid fighter, Rocky yeah. Papelli. Yeah, he's a big old boy, big old boy. Dixon? Yeah, he was. Right. Uh, six five, probably 245. Yeah, yeah good yeah, frames. I turned pro in 82 back in, Florida, back in New Jersey. Okay. I fought 11 fights, I was 82 and 1. Came back, back to California and just didn't feel like going back. I, they take me I, at 19 years old and taking me across the country and drop me off in a, a, a apartment back there. And I just, I, I wasn't mature enough for it at the time. I came back to California and I got blinded. I, I was... I didn't fight from 1984 mm-hmm. until 1987 because I was blind in my right eye. I, I, I ended up memorizing the eye chart. Okay. I got offered to fight in Japan in 87, and I said, well, my eye's blind. He's been blind. And they said, well, I don't think they're going to give you no grief about that. So I got in shape, went over there, uh, uh, Levi Billups. Right, uh, right. Over there, I had a good fight. I thought it could have gone either way, but did, did that did that see. fight did that fight go the distance? The Billups fight? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I mean, obviously, he was he was a very formidable journeyman. I mean, he fought a lot of top, yeah. you know, yeah, top he, fighters. He ended up being California state champion, I believe, for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my first fight back. He was a lot bigger than me, but he, even though I, I should. Um, I prepared and everything, just mentally I had fought, but I was blind, blind in my right eye for my last 13 fights. I didn't consider it a detriment. You fight a lot of bench things, but I'm sure there was some disadvantage. Oh, absolutely. What, I mean, what if uh, what if somebody was zeroing in, like you had a little swelling on that eye, they zeroed uh, in on it, and, and it uh, swelled shut. Now you're completely blind, you know? That would be true. That would be true. I didn't realize that you were... That there was a three-year gap. Uh, yeah, I didn't fight from I fought in October of '83 mm-hmm. and didn't fight again until August of '87. So and the commission, I don't know how the commission. I got, I went down to take an eye test for the commission. Had a buddy go in there and take the eye test for me. Okay. The doctor figured it out; it wasn't me, and then I had to go back and take the eye test, and I. I just memorized, uh, you know, three lines. I'd say I can I'd read out three lines and say I can, can't can quite make out the next one. And they passed me with, you know, passed me with the, for, for the boxing for the year. And that's all you had to do it was take it once a year. Right. So it wasn't the fact that you actually were seeing what was there. You memorized it beforehand, went in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't. <laughs> I'm blind in the eye completely. Well, I would I would definitely say that is a handicap when you're fighting a fighter that has good vision in both eyes to start a fight out with, you know. Yeah, so, I, so. I would figure so, but I would never use that as an excuse, for right? Me because I did all those things. I did that along with my own will, anyway. Right. So. Well, well, and and to give you credit, I mean, if you, I, I I break things down and I analyze things, and sometimes I understand it's it's you know somebody gets you know opens himself up and they get hit with a punch that 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 you were blocking better on etc but uh, you know looking at through tommy morrison's um you know and obviously that was a fight that i saw your fight against morrison but uh, in that in that first round you know he he was a he was an intimidator you know because he had a lot of power with that left hook and um and you 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 stood up to him and you threw with him and you know when you look at down at his record i mean there were fighters that he pretty much just came in and just blasted them fast in the first round like james tillis pinklin thomas marshall tillman i mean and these are you know former champions you know so um you know i wish i would have been in better shape and had had longer time to get in condition right when I got out and got in the ring, I gave it the best I had for what I had to work with at the time, yes, sir. Didn't you take that fight on pretty short notice? 13 days. 13 days notice yeah. to fight Tommy yeah. Morrison. I do have to ask you, I mean, obviously, you know, looking over, I mean, you fought Jimmy Ellis, Rocky Papelli, um, 
like like I said before, David Dixon. Um, out of all the fighters that you fought, who would you say was the hardest hitter? Uh, I fought a guy. I was in pretty fair shape, and the better shape you are, the better punch you're going to take. Right. Um, I, I fought a guy named Rodney Stockton. Okay. In Redondo Beach. Mm-hmm. The guy, I ended up getting 12 stitches over the right eye, 11 over the left eye, and he hit me with the right hand on the eardrum and busted, perforated the eardrum. So I, I've always kind of thought that he was probably the hardest right. fighter I'd worked with because I was in fairly decent shape and I was able to take a good punch at the time and he, he was able to. And he, he got me some good shots, yeah. Right. So I, I'd i say, but the, you know, the most formidable would have been Tommy. Did you know Tommy at all, like at, later uh, on or anything? No, I I, uh, I never saw him before the fight, didn't see him at the weigh-in. I don't remember seeing him after the fight, just saw him during the fight. Uh, I had my nephew try and tell me I saw him after the fight, and we talked, but I don't, I don't remember that. Right. Um, Right. Um, really, um, I'm good friends with his ex-wife now. With his wife now, really lovely lady, and she she's really trying to do what she can to, to keep his memory alive. And, and you know, do the right. Thing. So yeah, she's a good lady. But he, I know after the fight, I, he walks up and he goes, "Man, I got to take a good body shot." I'll tell you that. I always took a good body shot, but I don't remember even when it was soft at the time. Well, yeah. even in the post-fight interview, he gave you props for sure. He right. said, "He yeah. said, he said you were tough," but he said, "But well, you know, when he's a quarry, they're all tough." You know what I mean? So he right. Right. he really threw props to your family, but right. to you specifically, you know. Another fighter, and I know we talked about him before, was your fight with Eddie Gonzalez. I was familiar with Eddie Gonzalez because I saw him fight in Tampa. They, uh, Phil Alisi uh, scheduled him and Larry Holmes to fight each other, and I, I actually went to that fight. And you know he he uh, you know he went the distance with Holmes. Holmes wasn't able to put him down. Uh, the thing that I noticed with Eddie in that fight because. You know, Eddie started his career off really good. He won, like, the his first 24 of his first 27 fights or whatever it was. Right, but, right. But, he was uh, a good fighter, a good fighter, yeah. How was that fight? I mean, you guys drew, right? That was a draw? Yeah, and, you know, it was uh, the fight. I figured, I thought I got robbed. I had everything set up. I had backers, had everything going. But, again... Where I think the California State Commission had something against the quarries or whatever. Not me in particular. But uh, I got a draw. One judge gave me the fight 7 2 1. Okay. I knocked him down in the last round. Out of all the guys, he fought Bo, I think he fought Mercer, he fought Holmes. None of them dropped him. I, I dropped him with the right hand in the last round. I thought that should have solidified that. Right. One judge gave me the fight seven two one. One judge, not to talk right. the prejudice, but he was Hispanic. Gave him the fight five four one, and then the other Hispanic judge called it five five. Interesting. I don't want to talk, you know. It was, right, right, of course. But that is that is interesting. And um, who, who was your last fight again against? It was Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy Ellis. And he, yeah, now that, I, I was in somewhat decent shape, and I fought him, and I threw uh, a left hook, and he stepped over on my left hook, and it was right, right as I was about to turn over with the elbow, and I dislocated my shoulder. So the fight was stopped in the corner in between rounds because I had a dislocated shoulder. Right, of course. There was no... People want to count. It's a knockout or whatever. I was unable to continue because I had a dislocated shoulder and was doing very. He was slow. Right. Well, that is one thing he said. They were real surprised with my hand speed, but I was smaller. I was a smaller heavyweight, 
so I should have quicker hand speed. Right. Well, it, it, it's like when you see that uh, fight that you did uh, fought with David Kilgore. I mean, it was like I mean that that shot came out of nowhere. I mean, he dropped <laughs> like a sack of potatoes, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and that, I, that was one of the best fights where I got my jab to going. Right. See, I always went in wanting to throw blows with him. But I went in and tried to box with him a little bit and started getting my jab off. And you get in a situation like that, I couldn't win. I mean, if I beat the guy, it was as I did. It was a mismatch. But he was beating my butt until the until that happened. They can't win for losing. All right. <laughs> Right. Well, and and at the end of the day, I mean, it's like you know, he, he at that point, I think he was either like an eight and one or nine and one fighter. I mean, obviously, right, the right. guy the guy had skill, and uh, you know, they can't take anything away from you. I mean, you you hit him with a shot and that he couldn't take, you know. And uh, right, right, um, right. now, you said that uh, you came into Tampa that Mike was inducted into the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame. Yeah. And uh, did you accept the the uh, his uh, Hall of Fame award for that? Yes, yes, I did. Wow! In, in fact, we just uh, it's, it's on uh, it's on YouTube someplace because I watched it on YouTube. My son, my son found it, and we watched it on YouTube about a couple months back. Now, did were were you able to go up and give a a, a speech and everything? I mean, yeah, I just went up and said uh, thank you. Uh, Representing the Corey family and my brother Michael, I, I, we uh, honorably thank you and respect you for, for extending this honor to us. Right. Uh, I do wish Mike would have been here on his own to accept it, but, uh, you know, back in the family, the Corey family, I, I appreciate this and thank yeah. you. Yeah. From the well, bottom of my heart. What an honor. Absolutely. Yes. Did Jerry, is Jerry inducted in, in the Hall of Fame? He's in the California National and World Boxing Hall of Fame, but not the International. Which doesn't make sense because he's really within, what, the top three white heavyweights of all time? Absolutely, not, probably, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So he's not, but he's not in the, the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Do they, do they have, like, a... You know, football where you only have so long and then you can no longer be, um, you know... Uh, well, you can get injected with the old time. Oh, okay. You know, right. Like that. And they do that in, in football and stuff, too, I think. Where you can be the older group. Right. Recommendation. Well, well, hopefully they they write that wrong and 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 place them in at some point, you know, and and it would be a super cool honor that they do that in in your lifetime to where you will be sure. able to go and accept that uh, that honorable reward for the family.